Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome today. Um, Marco, go ahead. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, it's such a nice day outside. We wanted to share this slide with you about a virtual bl blood drive the North Sound ACH is, is doing. And we're inviting uh, anyone that is able and, and willing uh, to be part of it, uh, to, be, uh, to be part of the blood drive uh, that we're taking on here as an organization. There's a bit of information here on the blood drive uh, for folks that are interested in, in participating. Uh, if you also would like to uh, learn more or know, or, or know a little more about um, you know, sort of this, um, this blood drive that we're doing, please reach out to us and we can connect with you. Uh, but we'll maybe have like another, uh, and Meg just shared um, some uh, a link in the chat for some more information at www.bloodworksnorthwest.org forward slash donate. Um, but yeah, please, you know, if, uh, you know, please um, donate blood if you, if you are able. We know a lot of our neighbors here in the North Sound are, are um, you know, are, are needing, needing blood. Uh, we'll get started here in a minute or two, but please feel free to put in your name in the chat, uh, the organization where you're coming from, uh, as well as your, your pronouns. Just uh, as a reminder for the for these uh, learning sessions, um, you know, feel feel free to use the chat throughout the learning session. Uh, please keep your camera on if you're able, um, and just a reminder that that the meeting uh, is being recorded. So we'll move on to, um, it looks like folks are pretty much in the meeting. So we'll move on to our, the next slide, which is our land acknowledgement. And we'll talk, we'll also talk about, um, uh, so here, let's, let's just do the land acknowledgement here. Uh, so we begin by acknowledging with humility that the land where we are is a territory of the people of the Salish Sea. Their presence is imbued in the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people since time immemorial. So next slide, please. So today, um, this is a, a learning session about um, how do we how do we authentically engage with, you know, with young people, youth, pe youth in our community. Um, we'll discuss how young people can engage also in, 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 in advocacy, uh, and then the panel is uh, is 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 really about engaging and serving youth with on with on test. Uh, I'm sorry, with I can't even talk this morning. With on um, we'll we'll have an opportunity to have uh, a breakout for small groups. So after we go through the panel, uh, folks will break out into small into small groups and have a discussion on what you heard, uh, what are things that stuck out to you. Uh, and then we'll come back after the panel discussion um, to discuss some of the things that you took out of it, or if you also have some some questions for the panelists. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I know I, I know I'm really excited about this. You know, the the ACH as an organization is really excited about this this panel. Uh, we have an amazing group of of folks working with youth of youth in our community, um, and when we when we decided to put this together, we really wanted to build on our last learning session around uh, around advocacy in the in 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 this legislative process so also think about how can we work work with and alongside youth in the advocacy that 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 they're asking us for us they're asking for us as, as adults to show up for them and how do they engage as youth within with with the power that, that they also have right so i think it's 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 a both and so we can you know we can help youth youth as 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 youth have a, 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 a have have power, um, and sometimes they need adults to provide the stances uh, for them to exercise that power. And so this is this is a lot of uh, what we'll be discussing today. And uh, there's also in the chat some some uh, information of of a local event um, that I just saw uh, Dr. Luna put in the chat for folks that are interested. Can we please go to the next slide? So this, these are the learning session goals. Um, so the, the goals for today's learning session is, is about exploring how to center community voices and experiences in, in a meaningful and authentic ways. Uh, as I was mentioning, um, 
this is this is really work that takes everybody, right? It's work that takes all of us here uh, to be able to uh, serve our communities in ways that are, you know, that are authentic, that are fruitful, and bring the results that we want. Uh, we also want to provide adults and youth. We also want to provide an adult and youth perspective when it comes to advocacy. Uh, how can adults and youth work together? Uh, we want to through this panel uh, and the goals of today. Uh, we want to demonstrate positive youth adult partnerships. Again, it's that sort of working together between uh, adults and youth. And then we also want to um, we, we we want to have the goals of of uh, providing ideas about how to engage and collaborate with youth the way that youth want us to collaborate with them. Right. Uh, I think that's a, an important piece. And then an understanding of, of the youth perspective and voice and how that's part of the broader equity justice approach, right? We can't we can't do justice, we can't do equity if youth are not at the table, uh, if youth are not telling telling us, the adults, you know, what they want from us, what they need from us, right? So those are those are the that's the framing around today's conversation. And so thank you all for for joining. Uh, can we go to the next slide? I think that is all for our slides before we get into the panel. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for catching that. Okay. Um, so uh, we will begin by um, doing uh, some introductions of folks in the panel, if we're able to. Uh, there we go. Um, so we'll, introdu we'll, we'll introduce, or I'll, actually what I'll do is I'll give the panelists an opportunity to to introduce themselves um maybe uh, for the panelists if you could please tell us your name um you know where you're where, where you're from in terms of maybe an organization maybe a school uh your pronouns um it may be even a little bit uh, about you um so we'll just begin with uh with Gigi uh for the for the introduction Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Gigi Searle and um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Associated Student Body President at Burlington Edison High School. And um, I'm here because I wrote a petition protesting against an inequitable superintendent search in the Burlington Edison School District, um, which got over 700 signatures in roughly five days. And it did get a lot of attention from the public. Um, unfortunately, that petition was not successful in getting um, the search committee to find more candidates of color, like the community was asking, but um, hopefully our district is make or our district is um, making more steps to make um, the staff more reflective of our student population. So that's why I'm here, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Gigi. And then we'll head and go ahead and uh, pass it over to uh, Bella. Um, Hello, my respected people. My name is Isabella James, and I come from Lummi. I use pronouns she, her. I work with children of the Set and Sun Productions on the Young Leaders Program, and we also produce the Young and Indigenous pod podcast. It's on Spotify and Apple Music and um, Google Play. Um, we just got asked to be here because we're a part of the Young Leaders Program and we advocate with um, saving our salmon, but also we do a lot of um, like speech, speaking engagements and there's like things throughout our community that um, Daryl Hilaire has us do. So, but yeah, hi, Shka, thank you. Thank you, Bella. Um, and then we'll go to Kim. Good morning and thank you for having me. My name is Kim Kaleko Mokanani Gaffney. I am the Executive Director of Youth Leadership for Snohomish County YMCA. I'm also the Executive Director of Big Brothers Big Sisters Snohomish County. Uh, my role in both of my organizations is to advance the programs that we currently have for our youth. It's also to develop new programs for our youth. Uh, and it's youth that are currently members of YMCA and Big Brothers Big Sisters, but it's also youth that are just part of our community, making sure we meet them where they're at, create more equitable spaces, uh, raising the bar for our youth and making it so that they are able to advance and reach their full potential and their full success in the process of collaborating with the Everett Police Department to create more programming 
uh, to address um, crime prevention and intervention for our at-risk youth in Everett and Snohomish County. Thank you, Kim. And then we'll head over to Roy. Hi, everyone. My name is Roy Alexander. Um, I descend from the Nooksack and Upper Skagit tribes, as well as the Squay Band in Canada. And I've been with CSSP now for almost a year as a film editor, podcast producer, and I'm also a part of the Young Tribal Leaders Program. Thank you for having me. Aishka. Aishka Roy, and then we'll head to Haley. Um, Natsiam Nischelicha, Haley Garo, Sinis Natchuk Fomisin. Um, hello, my respected people. My name is Haley Garo. I come from Lummi, and I'm also First Nations Huwait. Um, Bella really said it all. Um, I'm also mm -hmm. work at Chilo Setting Sun Productions. Um, I'm part of the Young Tribal Leaders Program. I'm a, I also help with the podcast. And then, um, another outlet that I use to kind of get, uh, the work that CSSP does out there is I'm social media coordinator for CSSP. So I, do a lot of the social media campaigns. And that's really like my way of getting that work out there, how I, that's that's my tool to amplify the, the message that we try to spread. Thank you, Haley. So thank you all for your introductions. Um, at this point, we'll move over to uh, having having our, our panel discussion. And we'd like to begin with by uh, asking Bella, um, you know, if you could share your perspective around how adults can authentically engage with engage with youth in here in the North Sound region? Um, yeah, uh, well, here at Children of the Sun and Sun Productions, our mentor, Daryl Hilaire, really um, helps us put us in like leader roles. And he we, we really like, um, we always have meetings to connect together and we always do like check-ins to see how we're doing and you know what we want to do and how we want to do things like say the podcast for example like when I started three years ago I had no idea what a podcast was but they're like here come check this out like we want you to do this so we started just um, doing interviews and stuff throughout our community by interviewing elders and youth that um, that are very involved in our culture and it's um, it's it's really a revol revolved around like indigenous knowledge history and storytelling but also just like putting this out there and like having us speak at events like um, just like at first I didn't really know what I was doing, but they really mentored us and to putting us into those leadership roles and just kind of like, like now I'm a little older than, um, so now I'm kind of like mentoring these two and helping them throughout the podcast. And you now we, we all kind of just help each other, mentor each other. And then our mentors here also help us a lot. And like, with editing the podcast and making sure like what a lot of the writing that we do um, is edited as well. And we kind of just um, build our relationships off of um, them just helping us of, you know, learning about who we are and where we come from and why we do the things that we do. And it just like, it really helps them. Um, it really helps us, like we, uh, the question we just, it really helps us engage with each other and then, you know, it helps us um, engage with the community and, you know, other younger people that want to, you know, do, uh, want to be in leader positions like we are now. So um, it really, I think that's what I would have to say about adults engaging with us. Thank you, Bella. Haley, are you able to uh, share with your perspective on the same question? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the the best way to engage with youth in the workplace is just like creating a supportive, uplifting environment. And like, not, not to boost CSSP more, but, <laughs> but um, like everyone here, everyone's like really aware that like the young, the whole point of the Young Tribal Leaders Program is to have youth in the workplace, like learning how to do these leadership roles. 
And everyone here who works here is really aware of that. And so no matter who we're talking to, no matter what project we're on, there's going to be somebody who's helping us, guiding us through and just like supporting us and also pushing us to do our best. And especially our youth director here, we love her because she is like the most supportive person and we can always go to her, always talk to her and she'll push us to be our best and do our best. So awesome. thank you. Kim? I come from a little bit of a different perspective on that. Um, there's two words that stood out to me at that and it's authentically engage. And I wanna be begin answering this question by um, starting off with a story. Um, the other day I was driving in the car with my, my daughter. She's in seventh grade. She's going to be 13 in a couple of weeks. And she was using a slang term. And I was like, what does that mean? And she was like, it was Riz. And she was like, they have the Riz. I'm like, what is Riz? I'm like, what are you talking about? And she finally told me and it was slang for charisma. And I was like, why don't you just say charisma? And she's like, because it's the Riz. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. And she's like, mom, you had slang in your time. That was weird too. I was like, no, we didn't. I said, we didn't speak like that. I said, we, our slang was really cool. So she went on Google and she found all the slang from my time and she read it back to me. And I was like, that's fair. We had some really weird slang. I was like, those are things that I probably would never say again, but like cool and dope and things like that. And it just made me reflect on the difference of where our youth are. She says things like Riz and I said things like cool. There's a difference. So what applied to me when I was young? What applied to my, you know, my niece and my nephews that are in their 20s? And what is applying to youth nowadays is completely different, right? Just like saying everything changes. What our youth need, they're, they're different. I come from 20 years of doing youth work. Right, regardless of whether it was one on one work with youth, whether it was youth advocacy, or whether it was like on a platform like this where I use my leadership to be to be able to develop programs. I come from it thinking that, you know, there's three pillars that the YMCA and Big Brothers, Big Sisters we stand on, and that's you know, health and wellness, social responsibility, and youth leadership. And I apply those three pillars to our youth. It's important that we look at the demographic of all of our youth in our county, in wherever we're at, whatever region we're in. What is the de demographic? The socioeconomic demographic, the racial and the cultural demographic, you know, and what what problems are they facing? And making sure to authentically engage them, we need to have different programs that address all those other issues. We're going to have kids that are on that college track and they wanna be able to, you know, be involved in programs where it's gonna enrich them, it's gonna grow them, and that's how they're gonna reach their full success. So we have programs called the Youth in Government where they learn about the legislative process in that they learn how government works and that's how they can be their own advocate and how they're gonna be our future leaders, right? What they're talking about in that program, that's gonna to matter to us in 10 years, 20 years, because those are gonna be the issues that we're gonna be voting on. Right? There are other kids who may not have that advantage to be able to do that. Maybe they're housing insecure. Maybe they are food insecure. Maybe they come from generations of gang involvement, gang violence, creating programs around that where we can help with that crime intervention, crime prevention, and get them to a place where they can see that there is potential for success outside of that gang life and giving them access to programs and resources that levels them up and raises the bar to create a more equitable place for them. And then there's some that are in between that are really just trying to find themselves that were struggling from the pandemic and they missed those social cues and those social norms in that growing session to be where maybe these other kids are. So we bring in more mental health and that's how we address all three of those pillars for our youth. And keeping in mind, just like our slang, what we did when we were kids, what our, our kids did if they were older, isn't always going to work. Our kids grow, our kids change. Every single culture, every single race, they have different ideas of what is important for them and they have different ideas of what success means to them. And making sure that if we want to say that it's, you know, accessible for all, we really do create those programs even if it needs to be 50 or maybe just five, 
that they have access to so all of our kids can reach that success, whatever that may be. Success is gonna be determined by them. If going to school for five days in a row is success, we applaud that and we're gonna make sure we have programs to support that. If going to an Ivy League school is what they think is successful, great, I have programs for that too. If maybe not joining that gang is successful and choosing another path, we're gonna do that too. So I think in order to be able to authentically engage all of our youth is acknowledging that they're all different and all of them have different needs and as adults and as their leaders to be able to help them be the next generation of leaders, we need to meet them where they're at. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah, I, I learned about I learned about race from my six year old nephew. I think he's a lot cooler than I am. I was like, he, he was like, bro, you don't know what Riz is? I was like, no, I don't know what that is. No, my daughter got me a shirt for Mother's Day that was like, mommy, mama, mom, bruh. <laughs> bruh. I, was like, you, I was like, are you serious? She's like, bruh, it's funny. And I'm like, oh my God. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's hilarious. Roy, do you, do you want to uh, speak on that? Yeah, um, I can speak a little bit on that. I just think it's funny because I also call my mom bruh sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, to kind of piggyback off of like the whole mental health side of things, I think just adults being present and listening rather than just reacting, I guess, um, just being present and open-minded about youth mental health. Um, just because... I've seen, you know, people in my own family that are younger than me be invalidated by adults and just previous workplaces that I've worked in. I've also had my feelings invalidated. It's not a great feeling. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, just adults just being more present and open minded with our youth is the key to success for that. Thank you, Roy. Gigi, do you want to share what your perspective on on that question? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I think that a really good way for adults to engage with youth is technology. So for example, um, when I was creating my petition, I was um, going to go around and collect signatures, like literally um, have people like sign their name on the piece of paper. And a community member um, from the Burlington district found out and reached out to me and asked me if I wanted help making an online petition. And I did, had no idea how to do that. So she helped me set up a change.org thing and it was really helpful and super awesome. And just, I think that technology is an awesome way to like uplift youth voices rather than just kind of react as my colleagues said before. So yeah, definitely using technology, reposting on social media and stuff like that. Thanks, Gigi. Um, yeah, those are all those are all really good points about how we can engage with youth. And, you know, a lot of the a lot of what I'm hearing is, you know, showing up for youth the way that youth are, are asking us to show up for you, uh, being present, um, knowing that the times change and that what what you know what was maybe appropriate in the past was appropriate in the past and and maybe that was the past and we have to you know move with the times is a lot of what i'm hearing um so thank you all for that for that perspective i'm going to pass it over to my colleague michaela for the next set of questions um that michaela will be asking thank thanks you, mark um hop dotted to good morning uh, my name is Michaela Vendiola. I use she, hers pronouns, and I um, serve as the tribal liaison here at North Sound ACH. Um, and I am just thankful to be able to um, share the space with you all and to ask you these next um, this next question. Um, so for this one, um, we're going to start with Gigi um, and then Roy next. Um, just so you have a heads up, um, then Bella, Haley, and then Kim, um, you'll uh, wrap us up. So for, for the youth on this panel, what are things you wish adults and people working with youth did that they are currently not doing? Um, thank you. So I think that one thing 
that adults could improve on uh, is including youth on um, committees within the communities. I know that um, in communities near mine, they've done like hiring processes with students on the hiring boards. And I think that's really awesome. And it's been successful in those areas. Um, and I think that's a great way to really have like the staff of a school district reflect the student population. I think that's awesome. And um, just a great way for students to be more engaged. I would love to see more of that style of hiring processes in um, my own area and in other more in other areas as well. And um, I think another thing that uh, I would like to see more of is more active listening from adults. Like this is this is awesome active listening here. Um, but like, I guess when an, when um, a youth is speaking out for adults to maybe like uplift that voice more by like posting about it or um, giving that youth like direct good feedback and stuff. Thank you, Gigi. Um, so Roy, over to you, same question. What are things you wish adults and people working with youth did that they are currently not doing? Yeah, so like Gigi said, I kind of just have a very similar answer as, as she did. Um, I really do think active listening is a really big thing um, and just kind of like being more kind, I guess, in, in the workplaces. Um, because I've been in workplaces where I just feel like I, it's it's a really condescending environment being younger than people, um, just being younger than other coworkers, and then they talk to you like you don't really know anything despite you working the same job. And it's like, dude, we're here. <laughs> like, I'm in the same position as you. I got here before you. I was hired before you. Why are you talking to me like this? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but that that's that's what I have. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. Um, Bella, over to you, same question. Um, yeah, I think just to be more present and just to be listening and to just to be able, like, instead of like putting off something and knowing that we're not knowing what we're doing and just to like have them be there to teach me instead of like, let's say, um, what word is it? Um, I don't know, instead of making me feel like that I can't do it, I would say just to be more, more in of a position to be there to teach me to know what I'm doing so I'm able to do a good job at it, and to be able to um, finish what I'm doing so I don't feel like I have failed at it, knowing that I didn't know what I was doing in the first place. So, and yeah, I think that's what I would I would have to say about that. What was a good answer. Yeah, go ahead, Ailey. Um, I mean, I think definitely like, yeah, act active listening is the most important thing. Also, just like making sure you're giving the same respect that you would give your other coworkers. I've definitely been in situations where I have been like very like talked down to just because I was young and like again like yeah we're working the same job but I I was somehow treated in a totally different way than they were I was being just like just talked down to or like bossed around just in a very disrespectful way only like only because of my age and they weren't they wouldn't listen to my voice because they knew more or they've done this longer but I'm like my my voice is still relevant and I might I might not be the most experienced, but I, like, we do still have things to say. Thank you. Um, and Kim, for you, our question is, what are some lessons learned or feedback you have heard from youth that you work with? Um, and then a follow-up question, how do you use guidance from youth leaders across the work that you do? Thank you. And I'm learning right now, just hearing from you all on the panel about what it is that you guys need. 
And I agree that active listening is probably one of the largest things that I've learned from our youth. Um, but also within Big Brothers Big Sisters, you know, we have a policy that if you're going to sign up to be a men someone's mentor, it can't be anything shorter than a year. You have to be there and show up consistently for a year because it's going to take that long to gain trust from our youth, right? And I think that's one of the biggest things is showing up so that they they know that they can trust you and um, that you're there as a supportive adult you know, um, including them, like, like you all said, including youth voice, which goes to that second question. Um, it is very important for me as I, you know, move, excuse me, move our programs forward and develop new programs, making sure that I'm listening to them because I can sit here and come up with, you know, whatever program I want, but unless I hear from them that it's something that they need, it's not going to be successful. So making sure that I listen to them and they, they have a, a say, they have a seat at the table and their seat at the table is just as important as my seat, right? Because I wouldn't have my job if it wasn't for them. I, a lot of the people who I work with, we wouldn't be in the position we're in if it wasn't for our youth. They give us the ability to, to be in these roles. So they're just as important. You know, the other thing is, like I said, the mentorship showing up, making sure that even after a year, you're not going away that they know that you're, you know, they can rely on you in the future, that you really show positive feedback and you a positive way of living a healthy life. I think that's important, you know, not to do as I say, it's you live by example for them as parents. I think we can all agree on that, but even with, you know, uh, with just our youth, our community, we, we need to um, live by example. We need to teach by example. But in that, that also means you know, having representation, whether that mean a woman of color being in a position of leadership, whether that be a man of color in a position of leadership, whatever it is, I find that I create more equitable places for our youth and they're more diverse and more representative of the communities we serve when we have leadership that represents them. If you have a white man, leading a group of youth, nine times out of 10, you are going to have that same representation in the youth, right? That's one of the reasons why I introduced myself, although it's not in on my, my name for Zoom, because it's rather long, my middle name is Clay Kamakonani, and that's my Hawaiian name. I come from Filipino Hawaiian descent. I use my background and my culture a lot in the way that I address our youth, just so that they know that I'm not just another, you know, white presenting female who thinks that she knows everything. I'm very, very open about my background. I let them know that I came from a very, very poor family. I struggled. My brother was in um, the system for a long time. He struggled with addiction all the way up until maybe five years ago. And so letting them know that I may not be them, I may not be living their story right now. I have an understanding of where some of them are coming from. On the other side, for those that want to, you know, just advance and go to college, I understand that part too. I was the first female in my family to go to college. I was the first female in my family to have an executive job. Th those are things that, you know, making sure you're relatable. I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned from them. In order to, you know, actively engage our youth and be authentic, is being intentional about the way you talk to them, not just using keywords that you hear or things that you need to do. How I talk, to, how I'm speaking on this panel is no different than how I speak to our youth. When I was raising my kid, I didn't do the baby voices and the goo goo gaga. I talked to her like she was an adult from the day she was born. But because of that, we sit there and we have very real and open conversations. When I go into her school, I have real conversations with her friends. When I go into our youth development centers and we're sitting there, we're round tabling and they're talking about a fight at school or if someone got shot, they're very real conversations. And it's because I meet them where they're at and you're the same as me. I'm the same as you. Let's sit down and talk. So that's what I've learned from them. And then what was the other part of the question? Um, the other question is, um, Sorry, 
how do you use guidance from young leaders across the work that you do? Yes, thanks. I let them guide. Uh, a lot of the work, a lot of the programming that we do, a lot of the work that we do, we set the guidelines around it, but it's all very much youth led. So we're there just to guide like what we're supposed to do, but the program is only as good as the youth make it out to be. So if there's no effort from them, then it is what it is. If it doesn't move forward um, in order for the program to be successful. And I've seen this in you know, many of our programs, when our youth, when there's no buy-in, there's like there's really low attendance. And that's with many of our programs. And that's why I said, you know, making sure you have an understanding of your demographic. Um, and knowing where they're coming from and what they really are interested in. If you know what they're interested in and you let them guide it, that's how we're gonna serve them better. So I, I can give framework and I can give ideas, but letting them be their, their own leaders is really gonna teach them the leadership skills that they need to be able to be successful in the future. They need to start from now to be to learn how to be a leader. They need to teach themselves that skill. I can guide them, I can help them, or other directors can guide them, but that's really all we can do is guide them. Youth leadership is about, you know, I think it's a learned experience. That's great. Thank you, Kim. Um, so it looks like right now I'm going to pass it over back to you, Marco, um, to introduce the next section of our agenda. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michaela. Um, so for this next section, we are going to uh, do breakout rooms. Everybody will be put into a, into a small breakout room. We'll do that for about 15 minutes uh, to give you all an opportunity to, to chat with, with each other. What did you hear? You know, what did you learn? Uh, what resonated with you from the panel discussion? Um, how does your organization authentically engage the people you serve? What further from power? These are kind of some questions um, to uh, to discuss in, in the breakout session. I just put them also in the chat for folks uh, when you go to breakouts. We'll do that for 15 minutes and then we will come back and we'll give you all an opportunity to ask those questions or any other questions that come up that are not the ones that are are um, are in the chat. So uh, if we can please be put out in small groups and then those of us that are on the panel, will stay in the main room and wait for folks to come back. So uh, we'll see you all in 15 minutes. Um, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for participating in those breakout rooms. I hope it was useful and good conversation for you all. Um, right now, we have quite a bit of time to ask um, some of the panel or all of the panelists questions that might have come up from your breakout rooms. Um, and before we left to the breakout rooms, we did get one question from one of you. So we're going to start um, with that one to kick us off, and then I will open uh, the space for anybody to come off mute or put questions into the chat. Um, so for our panelists today, do, do any of you serve on a board of directors? Um, if so, do you have any ideas about how boards can do a better job of making serving on board a useful experience for younger folks um, or young leaders? And if any of you have thoughts that come up right away, feel free to share them with us. Thank you. Um, so I serve on uh, three different boards and I also have two boards that um, they're not governing boards, but um, they're more advisory and fundraising boards for Big Brothers, Big Sisters, as well as youth leadership. Um, for the youth leadership and for Big Brothers, Big Sisters, you know, the, the Big Brothers, Big Sisters, it's a little hard to um, bring youth a voice in that just because our programs, in order to ensure child safety, we have to stick to certain programs. Um, what we do do is we do invite um, some of our volunteers, our mentors to be part of that board, the people who are already engaged with the youth so that they can bring their voice into it. They have the most candid conversations with their youth. So through them, they're able to be um, kind of a proxy for, for their littles, for, for their youth. So that's been really helpful. Um, as far as the youth leadership board, 
we what we do is we look at some of the youth that naturally take a leadership role in their programs and then we ask them if they want to especially if they're like we we should do this or we should do that we ask them do you want to sit on a board and we I educate them about what a board of directors is, what we do. I talk to them about if we need to vote on something, what quorum means. I, I mean, all the way down the line, um, I give them a voice during for fundraising ideas, like larger fundraising ideas. Um, and most of the time they say yes. Other times they're like, no, that sounds boring. I, I mean, and honestly, there, there's really not that many youth that I approach that think sitting on a board of directors is fun, but there are some. And so that's been really great. And it's been, it's honestly is sometimes difficult getting youth wanting to be part of, you know, board engagement. Um, for the other two boards there, one of them is Muckleto School Foundation. Another one is for Archbishop Murphy High School. And I specifically do those because I want to be dialed in on the public um, school side as well as the private school side, making sure that I hear you know both sides of it. For the private school side, we are not allowed to have a um, youth voice on it, but we do have reflections coming in from them, and it's really just to advance the work of that school. They're really good about having their own um, youth representation in their school, so they don't necessarily need to be part of those committees or that that board because it's really because it's private school. Even though people think it's it, private schools are rich and have lots of money. They really don't. They fundraise all the time because they don't have funding from the government. They don't have funding from the state. So they're, we're constantly looking about what do we need to do to be able to keep the school open and keep it going? How do we offer more um, scholarships to, you know, children that need the financial assistance? How do we bring in more programs that are going to make us, you know, competitive with public schools? Competitive schools, are, public schools are actually really a lot more competitive than um, private schools are. So having that youth voice, it's different for the, the private school side. On the public school side, we do have um, students coming in and they talk about what they really need. It's like, at first we were fundraising for scholarships, right? But then they came in and they're like, well, if we, don't, if we decide not to go to private school or if we decide not to go to college, what's the point of getting the scholarship? You know, they get nominated by people to receive these scholarships. Like, well, great, but I'm not going to use it. And so they give us other ideas of how we can celebrate students in our communities, even if they're deciding not to pursue education after high school, uh, other ways of doing that and letting them know, this is what you need to do. Well, this is what we would like to see from our teachers. So if you are gonna do any initiative within the school district, this is what we would like to see. So for those, that's where the youth voice is important. And on, on my side, that's where the youth voice is important. Um, yeah, is it, does that answer your question? I don't know who asked that. Well, I'm not sure who asked it either. Okay. Came to <laughs> that, but thank you, Kim. Yeah, I think that super was insightful. Sorry, I went off the camera. I think that was Mike. Is, does that answer your question, Mike? I don't think it was my question. It was a great question. <laughs> it wasn't Mike's question. <laughs> okay. Well, are there any folks that you know? Feel free to raise your hand or, or put your question in the chat if um, if you have a, a question or something you discussed in the breakout. Um, Sorry, just quickly, Gigi, um, Roy, Bella, and Haley. Do any of you sit on boards currently, um, or could also be? like hiring committees, like you mentioned, Gigi, did they offer you that opportunity? Um, so for our like hiring processes, we don't have any students on the actual hiring boards, which I really would like if we did, but um, what we did was there, um, we had like student meetings and then people from the hiring boards came to the student meetings and like said, what would you like in, um, a superintendent and then we just hired a new principal and they did the same with that and um then students like gave their feedback there but um in the first situation with the superintendent our requests weren't really heard because a lot of students wanted a um, superintendent of color and that was not listened to but in the next um hiring process with the principal um they did 
listened to us and they hired um, a person of color who speaks Spanish and English, which is super great. So um, I think that like that process with like the student meeting with the board members works, but I would prefer to have students actually on the board itself because I feel like that makes it more authentic and like, yeah. And then we don't currently have any youth on like CSSP's board, but our board is very engaging. And so they will like ask us our thoughts on things and we've had lunches with them and they've wanted to hear about like what we think of the work, how, what, what, what the work needs. Mm -hmm. And so they are like very engaged with us. And then when we like at meetings and stuff, Daryl, our executive director is a big advocate for voicing our needs and concerns as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you both. Um, and then I suppose the follow-up question to that question, incentivization. Um, one, are you interested in being on boards? And then secondly, how can um, programming from adults incentivize you to participate? Um, I definitely am interested in being on boards. And I think that, um, a way that adults can incentivize um, youth to be on boards is having people on the boards, like adults on the boards be bilingual because in my area, um, Burlington School District has 40% English language learners, um, they're Spanish speakers. Um, so I think that that would really help if we had more bilingual members on boards in general to get um, bilingual students onto boards as well. And then also um, advertising, social media, super important. I'm sure my colleague who's a social media manager, Haley, would agree um, with that. And um, yeah, maybe like going into schools and like talking to students in person because a lot of students don't really check their email. So if you send out like a mass email, they probably won't read it. Um, but social media and in-person advertisements. So, so Gigi, when you say social media, what platform has been most successful in reaching that on the uh, your the youth? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I would definitely say Instagram, uh, <laughs> but my colleagues might have other opinions on that. Uh, I guess it varies um, for personal preference, but I think Instagram is probably the most popular among mm -hmm. people my age. Okay, thanks. CSSP, do you want to answer? Yeah, I think I would definitely be very interested on serving on a board or even just seeing like what that comes with. And I think the easiest way to have that is to just, yeah, like social media outreach, getting out there, give providing people with the opportunity and letting them know that they have that opportunity. Yeah, I'd definitely be interested to just to learn about it and to know what we're doing in the work and the knowledge and to hear about what's important and for us to have our ideas and voices at the table as well. I don't really have much to add to that. I think they, they said everything that I could possibly say. Um, serving on a board would be a great experience to uh, just learn and grow. Um, yeah. Great, thank you all. Um, Delfina, I see your hand, do you wanna? ask a question or make a comment, go ahead. I was gonna ask a question. Um, I, I, I'm just curious, like in trying to cultivate youth voice, something that I've encountered and I've, I've talked to uh, the breakout room about is just that when youth are coming from a background where they've experienced a lot of trauma or, or have been struggling um, with, with not enough you know, resources or are dealing with racism or ableism, I find that in all of the different youth groups that I work with, um, it can be hard to cultivate like this idea of like, what are your dreams when you've had experiences that have not allowed you a whole lot of capacity for dreaming. Um, and I recently participated in a hope science training that I found really encouraging because it talked about, you know, here, here's maybe a big end goal, but like helping you establish pathways, like the little steps. So I'm just curious to hear from the panelists, like any thoughts on how to how to keep um, 
how to contribute to those small step discussions, how to get youth excited sometimes about participating and sharing their voice. Because I think a lot of the, some of the youth that I work with that are the most disenfranchised, they want nothing to do with that. I'd like to be able to touch on that if that's okay. And it's probably not gonna be an answer that you're gonna like to hear, but it's not gonna be something that you're going to be able to quickly implement and see a quick turnaround. It's gonna take time. So like I had mentioned you know, earlier, there, there's a reason why we say that you, when you volunteer to be a mentor for someone, it has to be at minimum a year because a lot of the youth that come in, come especially to Big Brothers Big Sisters and to the other programs where we do mentoring, many of them, you know, come from a, a trauma filled background, right? And so, and if if anything else, they're probably scared themselves to be part of any type of system, and a program is in their mind a system. So, getting them through a door is a huge victory, and celebrate celebrate that. You came through the door, sit down, and if that's all you do, yay, and then you move on. And little by little, you start bringing in conversation, and it could be something about, hey, what, what do you think about Mookie Betts with um, his double yesterday? Well, let's talk about that. Something super small because they don't trust, they're, they're, and they why should they? They shouldn't be trusting us right now. So it's going to take time, and it really, I, I see this with, there's about 15 kids I can say that are in my building that go through, you know, my, my teen center. And half of them were housing insecure, staying in and out of a cocoon house or crashing on someone's couch. Some of them, you know, really bad home lives. I started March of 2022. It is now May, 2023. And I'm finally at the point where they can talk to me. Hey, Miss Kim. And they're talking about how they can get into a job here and how, what do I need to do to be, if I want to go to college, how do I do that? And getting comfortable enough to let me know this happened at home or not maybe letting me know, but maybe letting their youth development director. It took 14 months for that to happen. And there could be something that they do where just because of the rules that we have in the facility, we need to ask them not to come back for a while. And then they're gone for a while and then they come back and it's like kind of starting all over, rebuilding that trust again because you asked them to leave a space that they thought was safe. So it takes time and it takes patience and knowing that you're not going to be able to get to the point where you can start utilizing the skills that you learn from maybe some of your trauma-informed care or mental health first aid. You're not going to be able to start using that for a while. What you need to use is your own kindness and your own compassion as a human first and giving them space, allowing them space just to be them. Ara, I see your hand up. Um, I wanna offer you the opportunity to ask your question or make a comment. Yeah, less of a question, more of a comment. Um, while I have some space. So like kind of building upon what Kim was saying. So one of the things that I shared during my breakout room, and it's one of the discussions that have been brought back here at CHS that we're talking about as well as like boundaries, how to build boundaries, how to directly communicate boundaries and X, Y, Z, everything that gets involved in boundaries. And so one of the things that was brought up, it was such a great like food for thought is, and I'm gonna ask it for the adults in this room, how many times as a youth, were you labeled as rude or disrespectful when really all you were trying to do is voice a need or a boundary, but you didn't have the language for it yet, right? And I think it's so pivotal to think back like in your experiences as a youth. And like, if you're working with youth now in a mentoring capacity, it's important to like, oh, wow, that modeling, yes, active listening, yes, creating that feedback, yes, creating that relationship, but they're watching you. And so when they see you not uphold your boundaries with your other coworkers, they're going to think that that's an acceptable way to act in the future. And so 
we need to do our own healing work, especially if you're from a historically excluded community and you're working with these who are also from historically excluded communities, you're breaking cycles with your mentorship, with how you're moving forward, with that kindness and that compassion. And so I think that that's something really important to keep in mind when we work for youth, that we're modeling behaviors for them. It's not just how we interact with them one-on-one, -on -one, it's more than that. And especially with that boundary building, like if you as an adult do not know how to directly communicate your boundaries, like how are we going to pass that on? So we have to do some internal work ourselves in order to like share that with the next generation if we really want to do something different and elevate and empower their voices. So I just wanted to share that with folks here as well, that it doesn't necessarily have to be like, I have to follow this rule book, I have to follow the system, and this is how I'm going to succeed with youth mentorship or that relationship. It's like it is all encompassing and moving forward with respect and here's what I'm going to say, it's going to take time. Like that's, if there, that disengagement that you might see initially, they could potentially be trauma responses. They could potentially be like, oh, I don't know how to act within this system, just like what Kim was saying. So especially if you're intentional as someone who has more privilege and power positionality and X, Y, Z, making sure you're aware of that and how you interact with the youth and that, hey, you know what? they're not obligated to be grateful for your time. They're not obligated to act a certain way. So I think like breaking out of those perspectives is, is really important as we continue working with youth mentorship. And also just to say, I was absolutely one of those youth leaders because I had those youth mentors who empowered my agency and helped me build those leadership skills and allowed me to lead from like elementary school onward. I'm able to pass that on and be like, hey, I'm gonna show up with like this way and continue learning and unlearning and do all the things that make us, that make me healthier for my communities and for the youth as well. But so it it really has like such a long-term impact. It directly led to my work here at CHS and with y'all. So I'm just, I, I just wanted to share that with the group. It's like, that's something you can do today. You don't have to wait to, to do that. You can do it today and like take care of yourself so you can take care of the others. Thank you, Ara. Um, and Liz, I see your hand up. Um, I'll pass it over to you. And then we have a couple questions that came in through the chat for the panelists. Thanks, Michaela. Um, I'm, I'm sitting with Ara's comments for just, I'm probably just gonna be processing that for a bit. Um, I actually have a question. So being, being the fifth of six kids and being really old, I'm still treated by my older siblings as if I am still like 12. I mean, you know, it's like once you're younger, you're always younger, regardless of your age. So part of this is a little bit sarcastic, but I am really curious what terminology you all use to describe yourselves. Because I hear youth, young people, young leaders, emerging leaders, and knowing that whenever we label people, we're putting them in a box. I, I'm just curious how you would like to be described um, so that you are at tables being recognized as full and complete human beings. And because I think that's part of what I'm hearing throughout all of this is, can I be seen? Can I be heard? Can you see me as a full, complete person? Not like a half-baked, but fully baked just at a different moment in time, but I, I never really know how to use the young youth language. And like, I'm, I just would love any perspective on that from you all. And, and just like so grateful to be here in this space with you because I love the notion of just mutually learning along the way. So thank you, thank you, thank you if I don't get a chance to say that. Um, I mean, I think young, young is right terminology. We are, we're, we're young people, we're young tribal leaders. I think that there's nothing like there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think what the only thing that, wait, let me start over. Um, I think what needs to leave with that is that the connotation that being young is a bad thing because we are, we're, we're youth, we're young. We haven't lived a long life yet. We still have so much more to do. But that's also not a bad thing. And so I think that taking it out of that box that that is wrong or that makes us less than is mm -hmm. what needs to happen because the young language is true. That's yeah. what we are. Yeah. 
Thank you for that question, also. <laughs> Gigi, what about you? Any thoughts? Um, I completely agree. Um, I don't really have anything to add, but yeah, like young people's great describing word. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Um, so the couple questions that we had come through the chat. Um, the first one is, are any of are any of you currently involved in advocacy at the state house level? Um, CSSP as a whole has done some work at the state house level. We, like most recently, we had a virtual screening of our film, Our Sacred Obligation, that we co-hosted with um, Washington State Rep Deborah Lekinoff. And there was a bunch of house reps there that came to kind of just see that work and mm -hmm. be exposed to it. We didn't work directly with it, but we were, we were exposed to that. Yeah. And we're around that kind of environment. Um, yeah, I mean, like when I first started, I actually had an interview with Deb, and we also, Daryl also brings a lot of people in from legislative that, you know, he comes and introduces us to them, and we kind of tell them the work that we're doing and why we're doing it, so he kind of exposes us to let them know that we're doing the type of work that we're doing is important. Um, as far as, you know, Big Brothers, Big Sisters and YMCA goes, yes, we're both on the state legislature side. Uh, we actually, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, um, there's five agencies inside of Washington. We all agreed that we were going to hire a lobbyist um, to advocate on our behalf just because of our, uh, our schedules. So... We do that, but individually, we also take time to meet with our district representatives. Uh, I do meet with state, um, state legislatures as well, a lot of different house representatives. Um, and I do that on the other side for YMCA as well. YMCA is you know, obviously much bigger <laughs> than Big Brothers Big Sisters, but you know, there is a, a lot of advocacy work that we're doing. And everyone looks at YMCA and they think that we're just a, you know, a, a gym that calls itself a nonprofit. And it wasn't until I worked here that I realized that, you know, the health and wellness side and having the revenue is just a way for us to be able to do that social responsibility work and that youth leadership work. This whole, this nonprofit started with our youth. It started by being there for our youth back in the 1800s. And we wouldn't be who we are if we didn't continue to advocate for our youth and pushing those programs for our youth to make sure that we could keep going. So yes, on, on, on both sides, youth advocacy is um, a huge part of the work that I do. It, it, it gives me my job. If, we, if it wasn't part of you know my work with Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or YMCA, I wouldn't have the pleasure of being able to be in the presence of all of you guys today. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what advice would you give to youth considering taking on a leadership role? Do it. Go for it. Um, you know, use, acknowledge your own self-agency and go for it. You know, look at what it is that you need to do to be successful on it. You know, one, define what that success means. I think that's the biggest part is that and I'm going back to how I approach my career, how I approach things within my family, how I how I looked at it when I was in high school. What what did success mean to me? Did it mean just graduating high school? Did it mean going to college? Did it mean finishing law school? What did that mean when I and I, I went to law school and I, I after my first year I stopped because I was um, married at the time and I thought it would be better to support him and I was really hard on myself after I was like oh my god I failed that's I thought that was failure to me but then after you know some other things that happened in my life and realizing that law school wasn't necessarily the vehicle to get me to my end goal my end goal was youth advocacy youth work youth this was what I wanted to do um so I, I, I had to reimagine my success, my success. I had to reimagine what that looked like. 
and I had to reach out. I had to reach out for my own mentor. As an adult, I had to reach out for a mentor. So as youth, you know, it's important that one, we teach them that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay that, you know, that the, but it's also important for us as adults to show up so that they can see, I can go to that person for help and be in like representation, you know, there's someone down the road, there's going to be another little girl that looks like me and be like, I want to be her one day, but making sure I stay present for that, for that little girl or that little boy um, and help guide them. But just knowing that you don't have to stop, you, like it's, it's possible. Any youth, young person that wants to be a leader, that by that, that right there makes them a leader. Acknowledge, acknowledging that they want to be a leader makes them a leader. I definitely agree. And I would definitely encourage um, any person that is questioning whether they should be in a leadership role or not to definitely do it and try it out because you don't have to be some like outspoken face of the organization. There's like a million different ways people lead and it's all successful. There's no wrong way to lead. Some people work in the background. Some people like get the word out there. So, I mean, no matter what type of person you are, you can still be a great leader. And I would definitely encourage everyone to put themselves in, in leadership roles. Um, yeah, just be who you are and be you and don't be afraid of it. And like, just jump for the opportunity when it's, when it's right in front of you and just represent from where you are and represent your community and know that you're being in that leadership role and you're representing many others, you know, behind you and know that you're going to have people behind you that's going to support you into those leadership roles and that it's going to help and guide you to where you want to be and what you want to do with yourself. Yeah, just go for it. I mean, you're going to also like to not be scared of failure and to see no like like being told no is not a failure in my book like you're going to be told no so many times no matter what like leadership position you're going for like you're going to be told no a lot mm -hmm. but you got to use that no as motivation to keep going and to finally like strive to go and get that yes yeah it's kind of piggyback off that I'd say well, I like to say this a lot. I say it to myself a lot that that fear isn't reality. So just do it, just go out and do it. Um, I'd also say like never pass up an opportunity to learn, to meet new people, just to do anything, I guess. <laughs> um, I think that's what I would say. Thank you, panelists. Um, so any, are there any other questions or comments that people wanna make? Um, feel free to come off mute. Thank you. I'll make a quick comment. Um, just kind of picking up, picking, can't even say it, picking back off what uh, Kim was saying earlier. Uh, I, I wanna share, share a little example of um, something that I experienced when I used to work in schools. I think some of you know that I used to work at Mount Vernon schools and um, we had a student that a lot of the teachers and a lot of the counselors um, really struggle working with the student. And a, a lot of, a lot of the times the way that they will deal with it would just, was just to get them out of class. And so the student would, and then, and so the student was, was always missing class because they would just take them out of class. And when I came on board and, and, and got hired there, um, I was the only the only man of color in the entire building, so someone thought it was a good idea to just send him to me, which you know, which I did, which I didn't mind, um, because I wanted to mentor this this youth. He was uh, 13 years old in eighth grade, and he wouldn't even talk to me either. You know, like he, I think the assumption was like, oh well, you know, he's brown, you're brown, maybe you all get along, right? Um, and so you know, he, he, they they sent the student to my to my office, and I used to have a couch in my office, and I would have tons of candy. So he would just come and sit on the couch and eat my candy, and then I would just work. Uh, you know, at first I would try talking to him, and he would really wouldn't want to talk to me. He had his headphones on, his hoodie on, and then after a while, like it, it took a it like, and it goes back to this, a lot, what a lot of folks are saying about time. You know, after a while, he would he kind of started talking to me, uh, and if he would go to class and he would, and he passed through the hall, 
he would stop by and he'd be like, hey, mister, you got candy? And so I'd give him candy and then he'd go to class and then he'd get kicked out of class and then he'd come back and sit on my couch and eat my candy. Um, but after, I, it, it must have taken like, maybe like four or five months in the school year to where he started actually opening up to me. Um, and it was, and we wouldn't talk about anything other than basketball, which is what he liked. So we go out um, and play basketball out. There's a boys and girls club next to the Venture Middle School with the hoop. And so we would go out there and just shoot baskets for, you know, 20, 30 minutes every day. And then, then I started realizing a lot of what was going on with the student, but it took, you know, it took that time for me to just let him feel like, like I was somebody that he could trust. Right. And so um, for the adults, when you have, you know, when you have uh, folks like that in um, that you're working with, a lot, it, it takes, it, it takes time, right? A lot of what the of the panels are saying, and there isn't a, a quick fix to everything, and we just have to accept that that's the that, that, that that's the case, right? And so, anyway, so I wanted to, I want to share with share that story with you all, just to say that you know that um, this work of justice, this work of equity, is not quick work, and it's no ex, it's not an ex, easy fix where you just cross out. Uh, a box and so but anyway so I just want to share that with you and I see Jackie's hand uh, so I'll pass it over to Jackie. Yeah hey good morning thank you. Um, I one super inspired I think one for all the things you all are one sharing. Um, Gigi I didn't learn about one asking questions about um, searches for superintendents until I was one in my 40s and so I think one how you and came about that information there's so much more I want to know and also as far as children of the setting sun and before it's connected with ACH I dropped into a room that you all were hosting it was something around advocacy and and legislative and so I'm one inspired a couple of things I was curious I do follow children setting sun Gigi if you're comfortable sharing you said one way to connect is on Instagram so if you're comfortable if you wouldn't mind sharing your Instagram handles um, and then question to children of the setting sun um, what is the best way to connect um, with you all and then likewise Kimberly thank you Um, I think the best way to connect with CSSP is definitely social media, but also we have an e-newsletter that we send out weekly and that's, that's, I feel like that's where you get a lot of more like who we are, a lot of updates on what we're doing yeah. in real time. Um, like recently this week's, we had a salmon people gathering last week. And so an e-newsletter went out yesterday talking about what we did there and who all came. And I think that's a really good way to stay connected with us at CSSP and the work that we do. And you can sign up through that through our website. Um, maybe I'll drop the I can drop the link in the chat. But if you go to our website, you can sign up for our e-newsletter there and stay connected with us. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I dropped my email in the chat if anyone is looking to contact me as a resource or have questions for me. I appreciate, um, you know, Haley and Roy and Gigi saying, you know, um, IG. I, I'm not a really big Instagram person. I started Facebook when I was in college when Facebook first started. And I just kind of got grandfathered into it. I'm still learning about the other different um, social media platforms. Um, we are at, we're behind the game. So that's something that I'm gonna take back to our marketing department and let them know that this is something that, you know, hearing from you said so that's one of the best way to connect with them is through Instagram. Um, and and we're also in the middle of um, re, um, redoing our, reconstructing our, our website. So as far as reaching out to our organizations uh, by email right now is the best, but Hopefully, we will have a stronger social media presence in the coming future after talk for marketing department. Um, we have a couple more questions for you, and then we will wrap up um, with our close. So, what are strategies you use to remain authentic to the work you are doing? Like how do how are you able really just like how are you able to do the work that you're doing? Um, I think Marcia. 
if I can go first. Oh, oh we were on here. <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's all good. Go ahead That's and share your thoughts. <laughs> I can't right now. Um, I think just staying authentic in the work is just by, I don't know, I really love what we do with the podcast. It's, um, we're just reaching out to people and we always get lots of good responses from it. And we're just really helping people by learning about who we are and like where we come from and why our stories are important and how it's important for us to get our knowledge and our history told on our ways instead of the colonized ways um, because they're not really told in the right ways. And you know, a lot of people don't really know that, you know, indigenous people have been here since time and immemorial. And I think it's important that we get that message out. And like, even what we're doing right now, we're working on a mental health series and we're engaging with more people of our age to know that we all go through the same things and we're, that you're not alone. And to know that there's outlets and stuff to, you know, do the, or to continue to do the work that we're doing, but also just within our work with Daryl and how good of a person he is and the mentorship that he provides for us and, you know, continues to believe in us and to be put into not leadership, well, I'd say leadership roles, but for us to continue to believe who we are and to continue to reach for our dreams and stuff, and our dreams and what I would say. So that was good. I think the way that I stay authentic to like the work that I do is making sure that is all like also taking care of myself. That's like a lesson I've learned recently that I had such a problem with because I think being like being a young person in the workplace, I really thought that I needed to prove myself. So I would push myself so hard and I would take no breaks. And just to let people know that I was on their level when I didn't, I didn't need to do that. I, and also the work kind of suffers if you don't take care of yourself because you're not putting that good energy into it and mm -hmm. you're going into it in a way that you shouldn't be, which should be holy. But I would work myself so hard that I would, I, my cup was like half full. <laughs> I had like, I, I would be going into it with like barely anything left in me. And that's just not. The kind of energy that you want to put into what you do mm -hmm. yeah i think um i stay authentic with the work that we do by staying authentic with myself and really um kind of like you have to trust yourself i guess and stay disciplined in in work and that's something that i really try to do and i true um the, the <laughs> um i really do try to be honest with myself and my own mental health and how I approach the work, because if you approach the work with um, a really negative mindset, you're not going to get the best work out. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's how I stay authentic. Thank you. I think for um, myself, I um, try to stay authentic to the work that I do by um, I stay really closely connected to my culture, to my roots. Um, I'm very I'm. Like I said, I'm Filipino Hawaiian upbringing. I still dance um, Hawaiian dancing. I teach Hawaiian dancing. So I'm connected to the youth and we call it a halal. It's a hula school. I am connected to them. I see them every week. Um, my Filipino culture, I, say, I try to stay really connected with that as well. So I talk to them in, um, I pop into the youth development centers and I sit down and I have conversations with the kids. And whenever I travel around to different branches or different schools, I, I talk to them. I still take active roles in um, teaching some of our programs just so that I constantly hear that youth voice and also so that I'm present so that they know that that's I'm someone they can talk to because when they talk to me, it keeps me authentically engaged because it's something in person and right away um, I, I'm hearing it um, verbatim. I stay very connected to my daughter and her schools and her activities. Um, and it's a, it's a constant reminder, and I'm honestly learning right now. I mean, Haley is just sitting there with words of wisdom about, you know, her cup is half full and making sure that there's self-care. And I'm like, I, I could be learning from her right now because I operate with a, um, a cup that's maybe a quarter of the way full a lot. And I 
you know, constantly trying to tell myself that if I don't fill my own cup, I'm not going to be authentic to my work. So I appreciate you saying that, Haley. That's something that I need to be mindful of. Um, yeah, I'm learning as I go, though. Um, I stay authentic with the work that I do by doing my best to hear all sides of the story. So like talking to staff, um, talking to students and leaders of student clubs, and it really helps me be more open-minded and really like gain my own opinion while being educated about it. So yeah, just like reaching out to people and connecting with people. Thank you. Um, the last question is, um, what recommendations do you have for organizations working with youth? Um, Gigi, let's start with you, if that's okay. Okay, yeah. Um, I think that something that's come up a lot during this session is patience. So definitely be patient with the, the youth that you're working with. Um, and also just be, how do I say this? Like instruct um, people, instruct young people that you're working with, but don't do it in a condescending way. I think that's something that was also coming up earlier too. Um, but yeah, and listen to ideas that we have because um, we all have different perspectives. And since we're younger, we might have different ideas than um, older generations. And so maybe we can like collaborate with those ideas as well. So yeah, just listening. Kim, do you want to go? Remind me of the question. Sorry. Um, the question is, what recommendations do you have for organizations working with youth? Um, keep an open mind. Be willing to pivot. Um, be willing to change uh, just because, you know, you've done something a certain way doesn't mean that it's going to, you know, have the same result every, every time. Um, and even if you're working, it, even if it's something new and you, you know, put a lot of work into it and you start delivering it and it doesn't, you know, have the success you want, one, have patience, but also be willing to accept that, you know, maybe there was a miscommunication and you didn't really um, develop the program the way that it would meet the youth, you know, where they're at in that moment. Um, you know, they, we always say like when with our kids, like be present because they grow up in a blink of an eye, right? I mean, unless I, uh, Michaela, I know that I think you're a mother, right? It's like you remember the, the day that they were born and now you're like, where, where did time go, right? So you, you need to be willing to be present in the moment with the youth and know that they're growing and they're changing. And in order to be successful in your programming, you need to be willing to grow and change with them. That's great, thank you. Um, and Roy, Bella and Haley, any thoughts on how, or excuse me, what recommendations you have for organizations working with youth? Um, yeah, um, so this is kind of coming from my mom a little bit because she likes to say that ageism is very real in, in the workplace and it's very important to listen to youth um, because we offer such a unique experience and such a unique outlook on life that it's just, just listen, just sit and listen, be patient. Like everyone else said, just be there. Yeah, every person comes with their own set of gifts and being younger doesn't diminish that at all. And so I think making sure that people yeah just just listen man Kim said it best know how to pivot things change and grow over time so much and yeah, yeah. um yeah I just have to say just let them be involved and just find who what who they are and who they want to be and just like Kaylee said we all have our own set of gifts that we bring to the table so it's just finding that gift and you know bringing it back so that you can use it in the community and share and evolve and um yeah just to continue to grow thank you panelists um i am going to pass it over to marco to say some final words and close us out for the day thank you
Thanks, Michaela. Thank you, everybody. Um, we might get a chance to end a little early. Um, thank you all for being with us this entire time. Um, thank you to the panelists. Um, thank you, everybody, for staying on. Really good questions. Really good conversations. Um, we are going to share uh, some links in the chat for the resource library. Um, we will be posting the recording of today there um, sometime. Um, and we will also share other other, res other resources in the of, for the advocacy collection in there, other things to look out for to learn about equity and justice. Um, I, I did see some folks share their contact info in the chat as well, both panelists and folks that were uh, in attendance. If you want to reach out to them, um, this is a great way for us to stay connected to one another and continue to do this work here across the North Sound region. Um, I'll, I'll also will. Um, so this is what this is what the resource library looks like. And so thank you to our comm team for making this uh, happen. Um, I'll also will maybe in the last minute um, give um, anyone in the in the panel uh, the opportunity just to just maybe a last message that you want folks to to walk away from. You know, if you feel free, if, if you don't, that's you know that's okay too. Um, but if you had like, you know, one or two things to say to people, you know, um, as a, as something to leave us with, uh, what would that be? Any thoughts? Um, I mean, I really just want to thank you all for being here and giving us the space to listen. I think if, if, if you're here already, like you're already in the right direction of where you need to be going. So Aishka, thank you. Aishka. Yeah, just um, I'd say just I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for for coming. Uh, please be on the lookout for the next uh, learning session, and we look forward to seeing you all then. <laughs>